Hey everybody, welcome to the Indispensable Conversation. Will doing what we always done get us to where we want to go? Uh, this is the question that I'm going to be tackling in this next episode of the Indispensable Conversation podcast with my special guest, Damon Pistolka. For over 20 years, Damon's helped business leaders break free from holding, from whatever's holding them back. He's helped generate hundreds of millions of dollars in business value by focusing on strategic actions and clear execution. Damon's insights are going to be absolutely indispensable for this conversation today. Damon, I'm so psyched to have you on on the show. Welcome, my friend. Thanks for having me here today, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, let's get into it. So, Damon... Will doing what you've always done get you where you want to go? That's that's a, kind of a loaded question, you know, because if, it, <laughs> if if where you're at today is where you want to be tomorrow, it may. It okay. may. But unfortunately, in a changing world, we are likely doing what we're doing today is not going to take us where we want to go, and, and we're probably going to go backwards. And as much as we'd like to think that we could keep doing what we're doing it's likely not going to get us there yeah i'm with you excuse me i'm with you um like you say it's a rapidly changing world um while consistency and experience uh and current methods can certainly provide a foundation Mm -hmm. um there it can also lead to stagnation yeah and i feel like we've got to be able to pivot and in fact we were talking a little bit about pivoting before we went live you know uh and and adapt because that's what the new world if you will requires of us right Mm -hmm. so so embracing new strategies learning from past experiences staying open to novel ideas are all critical i think for continued success as, as we move forward i'm wondering you know what might sticking inside the comfort zone lead to if people are just so unwilling to change and they've, they've got to stay inside that place that they've always been i mean what how does that affect us well i think you know if you're talking about a business holistically um it's it's almost like death by a thousand paper cuts right you don't even realize what's happening over time because you go oh our, our sales growth isn't what it was a few years ago or it's it's off a little bit right or you go oh our efficiency's off or profitability whatever it is it's off a little bit but it's not off enough and i think that's that's one of the things that we really have to protect against is is it really just off a little bit or is it that our methods and what we're doing not relevant as relevant as it was once in the market and and should we really be looking at that with a more um microscopic view of what we should change. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems to me that people, I don't know, stay within that comfort zone for security reasons, mm-hmm. n- not recognizing there's huge risk. Yes. So you're really not secure at all. Yes. You know, to stay stay with what you know. Exactly, because they go, oh, yeah, this is proven. It's proven, right? It's proven. Well, there's... There's you and I, you know, we're we're we've got enough years under our belt that we what we did twenty or twenty five years ago or even a decade ago in business could be the thing that will kill us now. Yeah. And and it's just we have to and and when I when I'm talking with manufacturers, I mean this is one of my one of my core groups I work with, manufacturers. Mm-hmm. It's like you have to come with the times to your buyers to your customers to what their needs are and evolve with that um and i think too as people as leaders as as business executives that has taken us to a new level as well because our personal development you know the demands of the of the uh, millennial and gen z workforce the the market demands of what we have to be doing now to satisfy customers i mean just if you if you even just back up a little bit from the satisfying customer standpoint just think how our expectations have changed in the last just say seven years five to seven years and if i 
order something. Now, if I if I go online and order something, we could do that ten years ago, right? If I don't get a response back pretty darn quick, like in an, in an hour, that mm. hey, we got your order. It's right. going to deliver on this date. We're ready to go. You know, Amazon set that bar up really high. Well, our business is still working back in the stone ages where, you know, it doesn't matter if you're an industrial business that you're selling between two Fortune 100 companies or you're someone that's selling on Amazon. You have to be able to give your customers real-time information because we've all got access to it now on our phones. And it's what we, uh, that's the expectation of buyers everywhere. Yeah. I mean, if you can't meet your buyer's expectations, they'll find someone they can. Yes. And now they can do business anywhere on the globe. Yes. So, so yeah, I mean, we've got to sort of change with the times. And I, and I love the point where you're, you're heading. You know, I think stepping outside of the comfort zone uh, can really, you know, encourage personal and professional growth, mm-hmm. which... It's hugely important to remain competitive as we move forward because, you know, we're seeing all kinds of emerging trends, right? You know, generative AI is, is one that, that everyone's sort of talking about these days. Uh, robotics, uh, machine learning, uh, mm-hmm. you know, all, all that stuff is impacting the way work gets done. And you've yeah. got to be open to it. You can't just stick your head in the sand and, and pretend like, oh, this isn't going to affect me. It is going to affect you. It's going to affect you, if not directly, it will certainly affect how you interact with other businesses that have embraced these technologies and and use them, you know, hopefully to a competitive advantage. Yeah. Well, and when you talk about that, right, this, this happened many years ago in manufacturing and the large manufacturers, right? If you look at the automation that's happening in an automotive plant now, for example, for example, yeah. highly automated, highly, highly automated. Well, that, yes, there's some additional automation they can do in that. But now when we look at the generative AI and the other business things that are happening now, large language learning, just what we've learned about it and how we can apply that in these big companies now, that same kind of automation is getting more and more advanced inside the companies with their business processes and how they try to move data and and how they analyze data to a point that we've never had before. Right. So it's really interesting to see how this has come that way on the business side of things. And then conversely back into the, into the physical aspects of the world, just the ideas that are coming up and things that are being implemented all across any type of business Yeah. now in the physical world too. Yeah. I mean, it, it really is, uh, you know, sort of change at the speed of light these days, you know, you've yeah. got, I just feel like there's this fine confluence of all these emerging technologies and, and these things aren't all that new. I mean, we, we think nope. of them as, Oh, this is a new thing. I mean, uh, back when I hate to say this, back in the '80s when I was <laughs> in college, yeah, you know, I did a, a graduate thesis on artificial intelligence. I mean, it, it it's been around since then. Yeah, you know? and uh, yes, now it's at a place where it can be commercialized and leveraged. I think about things. You know, you mentioned manufacturing. I do a fair amount of work in that space as well. And Industry 4.0 is certainly something yeah. that a lot of the manufacturers are thinking about. But when you start to say, okay, we've already got a lot of AI-like things in the manufacturing world today, Mm -hmm. think about what happens when we take that information and, and get our arms around it and cultivate it in a different way, maybe creating the, the, the uh, personalized databases, if you will, that would underpin generative AI, you know? And Mm -hmm. think of how fast we can introduce even more change because now we can go back and look at, I don't know, maintenance records for the products we produce and and, and create, you know, language processing capability where the mechanics got his hands in the engine, right? Uh, And can like over his shoulder say, you know, how does the manifold fit with this, you know, the electric Mm -hmm. uh, harness and all of a sudden, you know, the things talking back to you with instructions. 
Yeah. You know, like, 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 just simple things like that are, are very doable. They exist already. And I think businesses are going to continue to, to just leverage this stuff. And you take that, you take that a step further. It's funny because I had this conversation last week with somebody about augmented reality and AI and how this route, just like you said, changes the scope of things we can do. Right. So say I'm Caterpillar and I have some exotic piece of equipment that we build a lot of, but it's say it's in a mine somewhere and doesn't matter where in the world. What if my maintenance person there could have augmented reality glasses access to that generative AI model that knows that equipment backwards and forwards, and they're having a problem. They're looking at that piece of equipment, and then it says, you're telling it what it's not doing or what the problem is, and it's sitting there figuring out, look at this, and it's not only is it telling you what to look at, you're looking at it on the equipment, it's going right, right there. Right. You just took all the levels of PhD level engineering work that went into that product and gave it to me that... I can barely start my lawnmower on a Sunday afternoon, right. and I can probably figure that out, which is right. which is incredible power it puts in the customers and their their technical people's hands in some of these things. It's just the the that's just one instance of how crazy yeah. cool this is going to be. Yeah, the, the possibilities are really endless. And, and to kind of get back to this whole point about doing what we've always done, getting yeah. to where we want to go, you know, there's risk right in maintaining the status quo. Yeah. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about that. Let's look at the risk versus potential rewards there. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, so just take an example like that. I'm I'm in, a, in an old line industry, and I've we we could be a hundred years old, and we could be a great big company, and anymore, we can stay successful for quite a while. But we have competitors now that if they're willing to adopt this technology faster than we are, or they're willing to to develop faster than we are or be a little more risk taking on the way to getting better they're going to dominate the industry over time we've seen this time after time yeah. big companies you know we look at some of the old examples like a kodak right that's not too good now we look at one that i just this last weekend spacex right who would have ever thought we would put a put a booster rocket up in the air and land that thing on a on a boat out in the middle of the water and use it again. Right. They, they, I think they said something like they've used these eight times now. The ones they landed this yeah. last week again, yeah. and that that's just a you know doing it the same way you've always done. Dump them in the sea, pick them up, do whatever you do with them, but it's not getting used again. Now we're reusing them. Look at the quantum change in affordability that they just they just sure. made for that that. You're gonna have, how are you going to catch up to that? You have to now. It's like going from a, a manual driving car to an automa automatic car, you know, yeah. driverless yeah. car. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, I feel like, you know, again, the, the rewards of innovation and change, while it can be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. is that initial discomfort of the unknown, you know, what's going to happen if, if this fails. Uh that's certainly a consideration you can't just go wild you know no. with, with this stuff but but if you again avoid it altogether because you want to stick to what you know you will be left behind there's no doubt about it yeah and this is a huge problem right because especially if you're a publicly traded company because if you if you stood up and said hey we're gonna do this you also have that huge pressure of short-term profitability right especially if it was something big that you had to try to do it's really hard to to be able to do that for the long term and, and make those decisions so as an executive or a leader you really need to be considering that risk and understand that the reward while we may not achieve a hundred percent of where we're going what happens if we get fifty percent of the way what will we learn on that fifty percent that makes us so much better Sure. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be the extreme example. It has to be just an example. You just have to make enough of an improvement that your competitors are still wondering, how the heck are we going to stay uh, stay competitive Stick with, with them? Yeah. Yeah.
So that's a really great segue to a question that I want to explore with you. You know, in preparing for t today's conversation, you know, the, the, a lot of different ways this thing could go, this conversation could go. But I, I really wanted to make sure that we got here, and that's about assessing sort of the effectiveness of our current methods and what metrics or indicators suggest that maybe we should change. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and taking advantage of that, which could be the impetus or the motivation to try something different, to get out of the comfort zone and so on. So well, what's your thought about that? What are you seeing with the uh, clients you're working with these days? Well, we're, we're pretty, I should say not pretty aggressive. We are cons really focused on constantly setting the bar a little higher. It doesn't matter if you're talking about speed, price, whatever it is that you're, or or just effectiveness. You really have to be looking at those things and going. If if I see that starting to slide backwards at all, or if we see a new a competitor come into the marketplace, or a competitor that comes in, that's in the marketplace already that comes up with something that, wow, it's really gonna gonna affect our market. We want to be that competitor. I mean, we, we really, so our clients are, are at least they're conditioned over time to be taking little, little calculated risks along the way and, and consistently because yeah. you don't want to take the, I mean, I, I said something about SpaceX, but 99% of the population doesn't want to take a risk like they did, right? You, you just want to go, our business needs to keep moving forward with the te technology and doing that. So. Your KPIs, you know, you have the simple ones that you want to understand. You want to say that I always that boil it down into profitability, speed, and effectiveness, right? Or quality, whatever you want those three. Because th those three, are, well, they'll give you everything you need to know from a business standpoint. Because if your customers are happy and you're making money and you're faster than anybody else, those are the things that really matter. And honestly, Speed has been speed and and uh, effectiveness have been the ones that have really uh, you know made our customers more successful over time. Yeah, I mean for sure, I, the stuff that I work on, you know, on the strategy side of my consulting practice tends to focus on those really sort of straightforward indicators, right? Mm -hmm. Revenue, how are we doing there? It's yep. uh, feedback from stakeholders. It's you know, customer satisfaction, but also owners, you know, whether those yep. are invested, if you're publicly traded or, you know, uh, family owned businesses, same kind of challenges, right? It's like, how, mm -hmm. how are we doing with all the stakeholders for the business and then market penetration, you know, and if those numbers are, are advancing, we know we're okay. If they're positive comments, we know we're okay. But when we start to get criticism, when we start to slip a little bit, when we're not making numbers, there's opportunities for improvement for sure mm -hmm. and things like what we're talking about today you know in this conversation come into play we've got to make sure we're doing those in a practical smart way right mm -hmm. we don't want to lose the farm on a bad yes. bet but yes but we've got to change we've got to get out of the comfort zone we can't keep you know doing what we've always done and expect the same result because the game is changing all the time Yes, yes, that's for sure. So what what steps do you think we can take to identify and overcome some of the blind spots that leaders sometimes have with this uh, uh, whole topic? I mean, a lot of times folks don't recognize that need for change. They feel, you know, that it worked before, it's going to work again, even, yeah. even if the numbers suggest that maybe they're not. Uh, yeah right anymore <laughs> yeah that's a great question what do you what do you think about that jim because i mean you're out there doing this too yeah you know i i think it requires a combination of self-reflection and seeking external feedback from the marketplace however you mm -hmm. do that right you can have the conversations with key customers you can have the conversation with key investors with key suppliers and and you know regularly conducting those sort of self-assessments so it just becomes part of how we do business yeah. I, I think is is critical you've got to have that baseline well understood in order to determine where you want to go next and then the other yeah. thing i would say is vision like what's our vision for the future where, where do we want to see this organization 
not just two years, three years, a planning cycle down the road, but 10 years down the road, 20 mm -hmm. years down the road. What, what, what's it look like? Who works here? What kinds of tools do they use? Who do we do business with? You know, how do we deliver products and services to those uh, customers? You know, what's that look like? And I think you, you need both. You need that sort of self-assessment yeah. of where we are today, and, and you've got to play that back against the vision for where you want to go. And you'll see yeah. gaps, and those gaps are your opportunities to get out of the comfort zone and do something a little differently. Because that's how you fill the gap, right? That's how you move from where you are to where you want to be. Yeah, and I, I agree what you're saying about customer and supplier or, or other you know, professionals in your industry to talk, to seek yeah. those people outside your organization because, man, we have tunnel vision when we're working in our organizations. Yeah. Tunnel vision is 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 a killer uh, because we're so focused on whatever it is, product, service, but we're just looking at that all the time in our own business. We really don't put our head up and go, okay, what what is the market doing? What are my customers feeling? What are my suppliers seeing? And, and that is powerful. That is very powerful. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I can't tell you, Damon, how many times I've been with a client and I'm watching them sort of infight. Mm -hmm. you know, the sales guys are fighting with the, with the manufacturing guys. You know, the engineers are fighting with supply chain. You know, it's, a, there's, it, it's all like within. And these folks and these leaders of these functional areas fail to recognize, like, the enemy's not inside the organization. Yeah. And the enemy's outside of these, you know, four walls, if you will. Yes. We've got to keep an eye on what they're doing. We've got to see them as the folks that we need to defeat, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not whether the engineering guys are smarter than the supply chain guys, you know? Yes, yes. Uh, we're in it together. We're on the same team. And we all have mm -hmm. a role to play, right? But yes. But we're in it together. And, and I feel like that mindset often uh, comes into place because of what you just said, that tunnel vision that, that you know, we're so focused on what we're doing not recognizing mm -hmm. that, you know, the competition's moving past us. You know? Well, and that, you, what you just said there, we don't even realize that the competition is moving past us because we've got the tunnel vision. It's like the, the old uh, sharpening the saw, you know, you see somebody passes, somebody's sawing like crazy in, in the woods, and they didn't you know, bother taking the time to sharpen the saw because they're too busy sawing. And, and it happens a lot in business happens a lot and little little and big it doesn't really matter right yeah i, I guess that's got that's places for for guys like us to to come in and play a role right we can help but yes. expose these blind spots and and push some buttons that maybe they can't push themselves how, how do you feel organizations and leaders and people in general i guess can balance this need for consistency in core values with the flexibility to sort of change you know to pursue these other opportunities because sometimes they bump up against you know uh the way people think about who they are and what's important to them mm -hmm. well, I, th I think it's what's a challenge there's no doubt about it because you are going to ultimately run into things that may conflict like you said but i think if you go back to your core values around you know how you treat people, how you treat customers, how you treat suppliers, and make sure you're not um, impeding or hurting any of, or, or working against those values, then you begin to see how this helps positively. Because we always are quick to look at the negative. And yes, we should look at that. But we should also be looking at the other part of it and going, what if? Mm. What if this is what we should be doing? And... So we really have to make sure that the negative is not going to be det detrimental to a point that we're going to go, okay, this is something that we really can't afford to do. But also then quickly, when we are talking to people, going through things with our teams and going, we realize this may be a somewhat negative con consequence of this. We realize this. Yeah. We could, we, could, we could put this automation in and it could take 
one third of this department doesn't need to be around anymore. Yep. But we also know that now that we don't need those people doing what they were doing, our, our thought is to do this with them to be more productive. Those are the kind of things that you can do as a leader in there to really be showing this is how it's going to help us all in the long term to win. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm with you. I think that our values have to be sort of the, the template. You know, it's the thing. You know, our behavior lives inside this. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, we're not going to put our values on the line to yep. make some kind of a gain. Uh, and as a consequence, you know, I'm a big believer in principles-driven sort of leadership where you you establish principles that are really statements of of the top leadership team's um, uh, preferences for how the business operates, right? And then you, you provide the rationale for why that's an important principle to adopt. And then you list these implications. Here are the implications that we're willing to live by, the prices we're willing to pay, if you will, to mm -hmm. live by this principle. And as long as you've got those front and center, you know what they are, everybody recognizes them, uh, then you can still take risk. You can still try stuff that's a little new without mm -hmm. feeling like you're going to compromise, you know, what's really important to the, to the enterprise. Yeah. Um, we, what one sort of question that, that I think still, we still need to tackle and we've got a couple more minutes. So, so I think we, we've got time to play with this one, but how do we leverage strength in order to to innovate? You know, what what are some of the ways that you're seeing your maybe your clients do that? Where they've they they've been doing what they've been doing, and, and as a consequence, they have these strengths. Now, how do they take those to the next level? Well, this is where I think it's been a lot of fun in the last couple of years for us to really with our clients to take these strengths and go, okay, how are these new developments? that we have out there, how can we combine them with those strengths? Whether it's technology, whether it's process, people, whatever, whatever. What are some of these new things? If we combine them, how would that benefit our strength to go, you know, not just a little jump, but a big jump? Like if you, if you said, and, and again, it, a lot of it revolves around uh, speed and quality, right? So you go, what could we do that could make our customer service people so smart in our organization that any customer that calls is going to go, wow. Right. You know, so that's a good combination. There's some people I work with that do that, do that kind of thing in the, in the OEM manufacturing world that really, I mean, when you see what they can do by enabling with, with AI, with some other systems around these, these uh, product around this product information how just like i said with that maintenance person out in the field in the middle of nowhere or, or wherever the customer service person giving them that power to be the absolute smartest their second day on the job because on the first day you got to teach them how to use the system the second day you have to teach them how to interact with the customer and the system to help those customers i mean that's what's so exciting now yeah and and you really look at these things and you go how can we how can we really do that? Take that strength of we've got great products, we've got great services. How can we make this customer experience dramatically different by mm -hmm. pulling these different things together? Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, it, I, again, back to the sort of self-awareness, you've got to kind of start with who you are, what your core is, right? And mm -hmm. then take the time to imagine the possibilities yeah and that's what i see you know a lot with the clients that i'm working with they they're they kind of need somebody from the outside an objective third party that doesn't care about the politics inside yep to, to help them step back and just imagine a world where if they could only do this it would be remarkable, right? If we could only mm -hmm. have a product that does this, if we could only have a service that's delivered in this fashion, how great would that be, you know? And it's helping people kind of imagine the possibilities that I think help them get out of the comfort zone because, you know, without that, without, without really being able to um, identify what's possible, you are kind of caught inside the, mm -hmm. the 
the the current paradigm so you have to help you need help sometimes to break out of that paradigm and that's where i see guys like us maybe playing a role setting that vision yeah because you, you know that imagineering is so important you know what would the world be like if we did this yep. and and you know it's back to that spacex kind of thing what would the world be like if we didn't have to throw away our rocket boosters every time right huge yeah so hey look we, we've come to the end i want to leave you with uh the last you know sort of 15 seconds what's one piece of advice you'd want our uh listeners to to walk away with take the time to think about the what ifs we could do that i mean that was just the question we were going over because you are missing a lot if you're not what ifing and and really pushing your mind a little bit um and and doing that consistently yeah I, i'm with you I, I love the word imagineering and i'm i i would put that label on it you heard it from the master damon pistelka thank you so much for being uh on the show today and I look forward to, to uh, bouncing some more ideas off you down the road. Thanks for having me, Jim. I appreciate it.